Hi, everybody. This is Leslie from the Live Animal Program at the Natural History Museum. This is Lunch with Live Animals. Every Tuesday, we are here sharing different animals and different topics with you. Today is part one of a two-part show about chaparral creatures. I'm excited about these guys today. So first of all, I want you to know that um, what is the chaparral, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know what it is. I didn't know before I moved here, actually, what the chaparral was. It's a biome, okay? What's a biome? A biome is a type of environment characterized by the plants and animals that live there, like a rainforest, like a desert, okay? Chaparral is a biome. And it's here in Southern California. Actually, I'm going to show you some beautiful pictures of it. This is chaparral, right? And if you have ever driven through Southern California hills, mountains, you've seen this before. Now you recognize it, right? Because it's also pretty commonly seen in um, TV and film. So what's this biome like? Um, it's got really mild winters. It's really beautiful, if you ask me. Uh, about 50 degrees rain that's usually when we get our rain all right summers though summers are a bear they are rough they're about 105 degrees or more and that means there's going to be drought and sometimes there's going to be fires although not as often you know they're happening more often than they should so all the plants and animals their entire lives are centered around this drought this this water problem these fires in fact, there's even some plants called file, fire followers that do what they sound like. They immediately show up right after a fire. Isn't that just the coolest thing? It's beautiful. It's inspiring to us humans, of course, but also probably provides some really much needed sustenance to the animals that are still around in that environment. So that's the fire followers, okay? I'm gonna show you, <laughs> When I first moved here, I was shocked to know this was an oak leaf, okay? Where I grew up, oak leaves were big and they're soft. These <laughs> hurt when you step on them with your bare feet and they're crunchy, okay? <laughs> but this is all part of it. This is about preserving water, right? So the animals that I've brought today, I'm going to talk about how they preserve water as well. I'm starting out, I have three different animals to share today. I'm starting out with some little guys I've shared before, the Baja California tree frogs, but I've got a couple of cool things to tell you about how they survive in this environment with drought. I've got one there, let's see if I can turn to show you the belly of the other one. They're pretty excitable, aren't they? They don't live in this environment, by the way. This is just so I can show them to you. I promise they have a big, beautiful home. So these little walking bubbles of water, they breathe and drink through their skin, right? How do they survive an environment that has frequent droughts? How do they do it, right? I'm gonna show you some more images here. Now, I think I've shown you this one before. On the bottom left, you see a coyote footprint. And in that coyote footprint are a bunch of froglets and toadlets in there using their spongy skin to soak up the water, whatever water they can find. Look, they like to hang out by the water. So if there's a fire, there's a drought, great, they can hop right in. But sometimes it disappears. So they gotta find it wherever they can. So they soak up the water with their little tush. Okay, <laughs> so that they can get keep that body moist. The picture on the right is kind of interesting too. I love to learn about secret animal body language. So you, you know, you know what you're looking at. We can't communicate with them, but they can communicate with us if we know what we're looking at. The picture on the right is a frog. If you ever see a frog sitting like this, they are conserving either temperature or water. He's not just being polite, okay? He's actually trying to keep that moisture in, usually head down too, so they can trap all that moisture inside. They also have a slime layer on their body, which keeps the moisture in, but also allows them to breathe and drink. I know it sounds contradictory. I kind of imagine it like 
spandex <laughs> you know you ever worn spandex <laughs> it keeps the moisture in even when you don't want it to but you can still breathe and drink Air, not drink <laughs> you can still breathe through it if you had to all right so it's like little froggy spandex is what their slime does for them <laughs> so uh, somebody asked if it's made of mucus yes it is same thing as mucus mucus and slime so uh, that's an important part of keeping that moisture in their bodies so they can survive these long periods of drought they're pretty inspiring pretty incredible little creatures if you ask me um you know I, I love hearing their calls. I've talked about their calls in other episodes. They have a very famous call. You can go back and listen to that. But when you hear them calling, that's when I feel like the environment is sort of recovering. It's getting there. Um, it seems the healthiest to me when I can hear those amphibians. Because if an amphibian can survive there, just about anything can survive there. Okay, another creature I have to share with you today is a western pond turtle. All right, I'm going to scoot him over here. Again, they don't live in these habitats, okay? These are just very temporary. They're okay. They're going to go back to their big palaces after we're done talking. But this is the western pond turtle. Here, I'm going to go back to big screen so you can see him really well. This is Pondy. <laughs> okay, he's being a little bit shy. He'll come back out when I put him in the water. This species is normally quite shy, so they actually have a little bit of trouble when dealing with uh, invasive species like the, the red-eared slider. So it's really important to preserve their habitats as best as we can. So I'm gonna put them back in the water here. He'll feel a little more comfortable. There you go. Let me tell you about these turtles, though, because the more I learn about them, the more in love I fall. They're, they're just really incredible. So they, here we go, let's go back to my screen share. And a lot of people think that turtles live in the water. They actually don't live in the water, per se, all the time. They use the water. They use it for hunting. They use it for hiding from predators. They use it uh, for thermoregulation, okay? It's an important part of their life. But sometimes they have to move around. They have to move around to find better water or food, okay? So if you see them walking around outside, they don't always need help. You might want to check with an expert before you help them. Um, unless, of course, you see them walking in the road, then help them along in the direction they were headed. Um, but if you notice in this photo, they're climbing pretty high, right? These turtles are so tough, or at least naturally, you know, we humans, we, we make a few more problems for them than they normally have. But naturally, they're very tough little creatures. They can climb. And I saw this in action when I was volunteering for the Resource Conservation District in the Santa Monica Mountains. Hi, Rosie. These turtles in this particular area lived in a man-made pond or hunted there and hung around there hunting for food. And when it dried up, they would move to these cliffs, okay, that have pools of water in them. And as those began to dry, they would climb to the higher ones and climb again to the higher ones and climb again. They can climb cliffs. <laughs> this exact turtle one time climbed a fence as tall as I am, okay? Now he's a rescue. Um, and so he has to live here in, in managed care. Um, but even in the wild, they can climb. So luckily I was there. He didn't get anywhere. But they are really impressive. I've even seen them climb brick walls, okay? So these guys, could you even imagine, though, if you're, like, hiking on a trail and you come across beautiful, you know, rocky streams and you look and there's a turtle at eye height just hanging there? <laughs> I think I would faint. <laughs> It's pretty cool to imagine. They would never do it in front of us, okay? They're just too shy for that. So, you know, these guys have an important story, too, of survival. Uh, the resource conservation districts in Santa Monica Mountains and uh, Riverside are doing really important work. Other ones, too, really important work by um, catching up some of these animals, the tree frogs, the turtles, and others, and keeping them in these times of really severe drought and times of really severe fires so that they can re-release them back into the wild. Talk about fire followers, huh? They're really, 
important work going on out there. Okay, so the last animal that I have to share with you today is named Bo. Bo is a gopher snake. Now don't leave yet. Some people are nervous about snakes, but there's nothing to be worried about. Now, Bo just didn't want to come out of his tube today, so I'm not going to make him. He's perfectly comfortable just like this, and this is a natural way to find snakes, too. They love to be curled up under leaf litter or in logs. So this is Bo, the gopher snake, another chaparral creature. Right now, a lot of people know, oh, by the way, they can also be called bull snakes, and they can be found, or at least they're very close relatives, all across the nation. They're really common to see in the chaparral. All right, so a lot of people know about how snakes conserve water inside of their bodies. They uh, even have solid urine, like marshmallows. <laughs> I couldn't decide whether or not to show you a photo of that. I figured you could go look it up later if you were interested. But they're experts at using, reusing that water and conserving it inside of their bodies. Right? So um, one thing, let me share my photos again and move on here. One really cool way that snakes can um, get some extra water, because it's not just from their food, is in particular snakes with strong keels on their scales can collect the water as it funnels down off of their scales. So if there's dew or a little bit of rain, I don't know if you can see his little head pulsing. He's literally sucking the water that drips down off of his body. Wasn't that cute? Come on, you know it was cute. <laughs> Here's a video of our own gopher snake. We've got, oh, that's Bo actually, drinking water out of a very shallow puddle after we misted him. Uh, so they can they can collect water in multiple ways. It's kind of cool. The last thing I want to tell you about <laughs> with these guys is they get into some trouble in their lives because they put on a bit of a tough guy act. I, I haven't shared this with you before, and this is this is pretty neat. So they want to defend themselves, right? Just like any animal does. These guys, when they're nervous can't show you his tail because it's all curled up in there. They rattle their tails. All right, so I'm going to play this for you. Might mistake that little rattling buzzing or an actual rattlesnake. Plus, they have these circles on their back. So unfortunately, they end up killing gopher snakes because they think they're rattlesnakes. Now, I don't think you should kill rattlesnakes either, but definitely not the gopher snakes who are totally harmless to humans, all right? So just to compare, okay? So I'm gonna show you that little, that little buzz one more time. you know, opens up their mouth. But let me compare to a rattlesnake rattle for you, all right? Big difference, right? Really big difference. If a rattlesnake rattles, you're going to know it, okay? So the other thing that's really cool, like unfortunately gets them into trouble, is they have an incredible hiss. I mean incredible. It I'm going to show you this picture real quick. This is called the glottis. This is their breathing tube in a way. It's like a snorkel. It helps them breathe while they're swallowing big food. The picture on the left is actually a cobra, but it was a really nice visual of the glottis. All right. On the right, you can see they've got an extra keel in front of the glottis, which makes the hiss really loud. And when you're next to it, it's kind of intimidating, I'll be honest. <laughs> it sounds like a cobra. It's a
he is saying, leave me alone, please, <laughs> right? I don't want to be bothered. Now, look, a lot of people get mad at snakes for that. I mean, all kinds of animals try to look big and scary, okay? No one gets mad at the tamandua for trying to look big and scary. <laughs> he just looks silly, right? If he could make a hiss, he would. Instead, he just kind of drools. <laughs> So the same as the little snake on the left. He's just trying to look big so he'll leave him alone. It's his little tough guy act. And I think it's just as cute when the snake does it as when the tamandua does it. Don't you? Well, I'd hoped Bo was going to come out and climb all over this beautiful climber for you. But like I said, I don't make animals do what they don't want to do. So I'm, I hope you had a good time seeing all of these guys today. And if I made you just a little bit stressed out by listening to snake hisses and rattles, I'm going to leave you with an image of a gopher snake wearing a ladybug for a hat. <laughs> um, thank you for joining me. I want to thank the Resource Conservation Districts for all their incredible work. And also for California Herps, an amazing website where you can learn all about Southern California's reptiles and amphibians, or actually all of California's reptiles and amphibians. Next week, Forrest is going to also be sharing some chaparral creatures, and he'll be sharing some invertebrates. Nice to be with you again. Take care, everyone.